Welcome to the Scripting Sales Podcast. My name is Ryan Paris, and I will be the one running this podcast and asking the questions and calling the shots. So subscribe or unsubscribe, either way, we're going to have a really good time. We're also going to talk about some amazing topics that I don't think have really ever been discussed on a consistent basis within the sales community. So if you're into talking about scripting, sales structure, and conversations relevant for the 21st century, especially with the rise of ChatGPT, this is the place to be. Let's go. Episode two, we're gonna talk a little bit about myself. Yes, it is time for you to get to know me as a host. I uh, think this is important because a lot of what you will hear going forward comes from a foundation that uh, has lit a fire inside me and allowed me to go down this path. And I'm also going to be exploring a lot of areas that I have not yet discovered and I'm hoping to learn from the audience. I'm hoping to learn from others. I'm hoping to learn from others who have pioneered sales scripting and sales conversation structure. Okay, so let's get to know me a little bit. Uh, as you can see, I am a avid US men's soccer team fan. We'll start with that. The reason I wanna talk about that is because soccer is my first passion. I'm sorry selling, soccer does come first in my heart, but I'm committed to selling in my profession. I love the idea of connecting from zero to one and connecting people to value. But my soccer does flow from a place of strictly passion. And I think that's super important, whatever you're doing in life, to do something that you're passionate about, because you really receive a lot of energy that you can put other places. So I've played since I was a kid. I played a little bit of college, a, a couple semi pro leagues. And right now, I manage and still play on in my ripe age of 38 on an amateur semi-pro soccer team called Philadelphia Heritage. Uh, I started the club back in 2020. And if you know anything about the amateur or semi-pro scene in the US, it is growing. What's cool about that is, you know, if just a little tangent on soccer, you probably have seen a lot of football in the US baseball, um, and a variety of other sports before you hear about soccer, but it's starting to rise in the ranks. And I think the scene is starting to grow where we are trying to match other countries. And one of the gaps that the U S uh, has always had is kind of a development into the higher levels. And so we're always about the college system and you get drafted where in other places you rise up the ranks and you're with a club your whole life, or when you get into uh, the pro status, you know, you, you go into higher leagues where in the U S it's just different, but we're making that connection. So instead of college players, either going to the big leagues like MLS or doing nothing, there's now a lot of uh, in between development leagues after college. And it's a huge market right now. And so it's a really fun time to be within us soccer. So that's what I do outside of superhuman prospecting and H to H. I have an amazing um, purpose and team at superhuman and H to H and in the off hours. That's what I do. I run this team and I, and I play, get all the stress out. Um, it's a great combination. A lot of lessons to be learned with sports too, to bring up that analogy um, in a performance environment. When you have people, there's always lessons that transfer over to the, the business into uh, for profit or uh, even even nonprofit anywhere there's people that have jobs to be done there's a lot of correlation with sports and working with work teams so a lot to talk about there in the future uh, I live in Philadelphia the Philadelphia area I'm originally from Toledo Ohio uh, some people call it the Midwest some people call it the Middle East who knows? It's just a blank area in the U.S. Um, you know, shout out Toledo, shout out Cleveland, Ohio State, 
you know, those are the places I support. I've been from. So uh, moved out here to the Philadelphia area. I went to Messiah College as an undergrad, spent a semester at Temple through an exchange program that we had uh, where we had a campus in the city, fell in love with the city. Uh, and that's kind of where the connection came to Philadelphia. So uh, traveled around a little bit after I graduated. I uh, pursued some soccer things. Um, I played my first NCAA credit uh, as a late 20 year old uh, at, at Palm Beach Atlantic in Florida. Uh, I also traveled around playing in New Zealand. I played in the Philadelphia area, uh, but all during this time I was working, you know, um, I was working for my dad's company. He has a small ed tech uh, business out of Ohio and I was working remotely in his business development. And I was thinking of my, my career up to this point, you know, my connection to selling and some of the jobs that I had. And I decided that I was going to start my business. Uh, I was going to start a business when I was done with my uh, kind of soccer journey at the time. So I decided that Philadelphia would be that place. You know, I had some roots here. A lot of my college friends had migrated that area. I had some connections. So I decided to start it in the Philadelphia region. And that's where it all began with Superhuman and H2H. Uh, started that, moved back here in about 2015, and here we are, right? Uh, seven or eight years later, uh, we are in the thick of the uh, outsourced sales development game and also in the cold call conversation structure, which is going to be increasingly relevant as we're going to discuss with the rise of digital, chat GPT, and a lot of different things going on in the market. So there's a little bit of history of, uh, of myself and just to get to know me a little bit in terms of selling, you know, why did I get into set into sales into the profession, you know, and how did I get here? It's a question that I've actually had to ask myself a lot over the past several years as um, we've grown superhuman, because as you grow, you have to have a deeper foundation and deeper roots uh, to know your why and to withstand a lot of the pressures and negativity and tests that you go through. So as I go deeper into my, uh, my past and into why and how in sales, you know, I've, I've kind of had a newer revelation in the past few years. Um, and something that maybe I wasn't willing to admit some things that I feel embarrassed about, um, some things that I am proud of, but either way, it doesn't matter. It's, it's how we got here today and, and the things that we're doing in the market with the business, with people on our company, um, you know, with, with, uh, looking to elevate and advance the sales profession in the 21st century. And so some of those things started really young. Uh, I was raised as a, uh, conservative evangelical Christian. And if you are familiar with that, uh, that essentially means that, you know, I was raised to spread the news and gospel of Jesus Christ at a very young age. Uh, I was raised in a, a church that promoted that. I was raised in a family that promoted that. And that was my upbringing. You know, my job here on earth, as I was told, was to uh, literally convert folks uh, from their non-believing status to a born again Christian that would go to heaven. And if they didn't, then they would go to hell. And so I smile while I say that, um, you know, for several reasons, but it's, I look, I, I look back at that and that's, that's crazy how close it is to selling, isn't it? I basically was just talking about a Jesus sales funnel. I mean, that's, that's what it was. My job, my job was to take cold, prospects who are not converted and spread the news, get them to believe in Jesus so that they would close the deal and say the prayer. And that was my job growing up. I would go on mission trips. I've been to, uh, I've been overseas. I've been to, um, Central America, to Africa, to spread the news of Jesus. I've been to New York City in Central Park, walking around with tracks, uh, 
walking up to strangers, you can see the correlation, starting a conversation, um, building trust that they would stay in that conversation, you know, with us so that we weren't looked at as crazy and uh, ask questions about their life and then present value in the gospel of Jesus and close the deal, get them to say the prayer so that they would join us in heaven after we die. Uh, look, this isn't the way the whole podcast is going to go, by the way. I'm just, I'm literally sharing with you my my development here of what I've come uh, to, to stand for and what I've come to develop as a skill set that has got me um, very passionate about the way that we go about selling. And I look back at this and I think, yeah, that's not who I am today, but I also... I uh, do think that there was, at the time, uh, some very good things that came out of that. Uh, I hope other folks' lives were influenced in a positive way. Um, but I look at the at a, at a young age, how that was drilled into me and how that became part of my nature um, in different applications throughout my life. You know, I think that also spawned a uh, a fearless and almost just... Um, shameless way of interacting with people when it had to do with business. Um, you know, as I got into my early to mid teens, I had no shame in selling newspapers, uh, going door to door and um, getting folks to subscribe to the, uh, the old orchard neighborhood paper. Uh, I had no shame in starting a business with one of my soccer teammates and doing landscaping and odd jobs around the neighborhood, you know, flyers, phone numbers, inbound calls at 15, 16 years old. And this was also a time that eBay emerged. So uh, you see this foundation of conversion, right? At a young age, um, translating itself into uh, landscaping, doing odd jobs and all while the internet boom and uh, this is back, right? 2000, like early 2000s, the late 1990s, we're going back now. Um, you know, this is a time where the internet was first kind of um, making itself available to the general public. So, you know, eBay, had emerged. I found out about eBay, was curious about it. And the knack for selling and connection and conversion, um, you know, also found itself trying to apply it on eBay. So flea markets, garage sales, what could I flip? You know, I remember my first sale on eBay was some type of race car helmet that was sitting in our neighbor's basement for about 10 years, they said, and they said, it's just time to get rid of it. Um, this thing was old, but it was sapphire blue. Um, I remember like the foam inside was like crumbling. <laughs> and I was like, look, I'm not going to be wearing this. I'm not going to put this on because you have those dust that just drops on you, but maybe somebody would find this valuable. And I started to learn how to sell. I started to learn how to write language that was appealing, but also truthful. You know, I couldn't lie because you had ratings on eBay, you know, and this was early on. So you had to make sure that all the truth was out about the products you were selling, but you had to then uh, wordsmith so that it connected with people that were looking for certain things. And what an amazing invention eBay, um, because that started a, a path of learning how to craft messaging that would connect. I mean, once I started to see that value, you know, I sold that first, I think I got that helmet for $3 and sold it for 60 and it felt like I won the lottery. I mean, at 16 years old to have, I don't even know what percentage of margin that is. Um, but it was enough for me to say, this is a path that I could go down. This is exhilarating. It's fun. I can make these connections and there's money to be made. And I got myself through college at, you know, through high school and college, 
going to auctions, flipping things, researching, looking at my competition, finding the language that would allow me to sell over others. So you can see the development, right? We have a superhuman prospecting that was established in uh, 2017. I started the consulting side in 2015 doing cold call scripts on Fiverr and other online freelance sites starting at five bucks. Yeah, $5 custom scripts, imagine. Uh, and also some cold call training. You know, we've done that since 2015, 2016. Uh, and, you know, we've had those two sides. We've had the consulting side, we've had this outsourced sales service side uh, six, seven, eight years now. But that gap in between, right? You can see some of those early developments as a kid. Um, you know, what was ingrained in me, what was a part of me without, you know, really being aware of what was going on. So let's fast forward, uh, end of college, you know, graduated with, um, at a liberal arts school, a Christian liberal arts school, Messiah College, um, great school. Uh, as the farther I uh, move away from college, the more I appreciate the type of school it was. Um, conservative, you know, a lot of conservative Christian folks went there I mean, we only have 3000 or 4000 folks at the time now it's called Messiah University. But three 4000 folks there at the time. Uh, you know, a lot of conservative folks went there. But you know, I was surprised and also unprepared to be hit with a wave of open minded individuals coming from a wide range of backgrounds and diverse uh, stories, diverse people that had a major impact and change in who I was. And uh, it really opened me up to a lot of things as a person, uh, but also to see the amount of incredible talent and folks with talent and skill coming from a place of, I think, true passion and desire to contribute to the world once they graduated. And I was deeply impacted by that. The folks I lived with, the folks I went to class with, um, the other groups that I was involved with is incredibly positive impact on me as I, as I, you know, went forward along life, you know, but I had a lot of folks, even just the folks I lived with, I graduated with, uh, someone who's now a priest, uh, in the Harrisburg area. I graduated with uh, someone who's now, uh, a doctorate of physical therapy at the university of Kentucky, uh, you know, uh, software engineer uh, at Google, um, superintendent of a uh, of a construction company in Northern California. Just really incredible backgrounds and different avenues that people have gone down. That I think was interesting because at the time when I graduated, I'd always been in. I was a business administration major. I was in. Uh, I was in sales type of roles, even though at that time there was no such thing as a sales class, a profession of selling direction. It was all just general business, right? Accounting, finance, marketing, um, strategy, leadership. And while I love those classes and have helped me today to, to manage and run Superhuman and H2H, uh, there wasn't a focus. And so when I graduated and I got a job as a sales development manager, at the time it was called a uh, outside events lead generation manager, but, you know, kind of translating that language to today's uh, selling vocabulary, it would be a sales development manager. Um, you know, sharing that with others, I, I, I'll be honest, I was embarrassed. You know, that I was so impressed with the people around me and the directions that they were going. I was, uh, I was embarrassed to say I was in sales and it, it was crazy because I knew that I was good at it. I knew that I had a knack for it, but I didn't know that it was a profession that was honorable, that had respect, that could have respect. Uh, and so when I, when I went to my first role, you know, I went to kind of a, uh, mid size corporate, um, remodeling business that was regional. I think they spanned from Iowa to Virginia up to, I think, New York in the remodeling space. 
And so that was a very, very tough time. You know, if you see, again, kind of going back to the progression early, you know, very connected to church, going, moving into uh, more of the entrepreneurship next as I had as a, as a, uh, you know, late teen into college kind of transitioning here was a very tough testing time for me, um, you know, because you see this, this background of talent that's developing, but you also see a kind of a resistance in kind of a macro resistance against selling. You know, what, why was it that sales had this, why weren't there classes for selling? Why wasn't there a degree that I could choose? Why, why did it have a negative stigma? And, and so there was this, this moment where I, as I was developing, I, I had this good, you know, good experience type of role, got paid peanuts, but it was for this remodeling company where the methodology for selling the philosophy was an outdated, aggressive cutthroat philosophy for winning money and taking it from others legally. That's, that's how you could define it. I mean, it was, what was the, what was the way that you get someone to say yes at all costs? And, uh, I saw the damage that did, you know, as my, I had 40 reps that 40 sales reps that I managed, uh, immediately after, after school, 23 years old, my job was to generate leads at, um, uh, events, malls, uh, street fairs and set up appointments for the sales team to go and close, you know, in-home remodeling estimates. And if you know anything about that industry, it is a one call close industry. I mean, we're talking Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, boiler room, uh, mentality. That was the way that we were taught, you know, either close them then, or you lost the deal. So the, the values that were shared with us were, I mean, people were given high fives and fist bumps for having cops called on them in folks' homes if they if, if they said no to a deal. That that's the level of intensity and aggressiveness because they were all 100% commission and if they didn't close a deal that night, they weren't getting fed. So add that with the push from management to close those deals and you have a disaster for a profession waiting to happen. And so, you know, I wasn't in those homes. My, my job was to set up those appointments. My job was to train team members, write scripts, uh, get everyone on the same page to, you know, uh, go out and market and with the same philosophy at malls, events, street fairs to generate leads while people walk by, engage them, um, ask them questions, but also close the deal right there. It was the same mentality, you know, whatever we could do to get them to say yes, to then get in their home, to do whatever we could do to get them to give us their money. So that was the moment. That's the moment to shed light on what I'm talking about at this time where my friends had these incredible jobs in good traditional industries and new emerging fashionable industries. You know, I was at this outdated profession that seemingly was evil. Uh, I remember, I remember one time, uh, this company had slowly grown into my hometown, Toledo, Ohio. And I had a friend from high school and, you know, middle school who said, Oh, you work for this company. Uh, that's awesome. And maybe we'll have someone come out, you know, we'll support you and we need, we have a need. I'm like, that's, that's great. But deep down, you know, I know the possibilities of what can come. Uh, so after that, uh, they had someone go out to that home. They wouldn't leave the house. They, my friend said they weren't ready. They were interested, but they didn't want to purchase that night. And they had to call again, the cops to get this person to leave. And I'm just thinking, is this what I'm in for the rest of my life? Is this where I'm going? Is this the reputation that I am going to stand behind? 
So in about 2000 and I guess it would be about 2008, 2009, I had an offer to go uh, work somewhere else at a construction company as a regional sales manager in a completely different environment, which relieved me from a lot of stress at the time. You know, these kind of strains between talent and passion, but a serious dichotomy and diabolical difference and uh, kind of cognitive dissonance I had in my heart of hearts uh, gave me a little bit of a relief at the time. But it just started to initiate all these questions, you know, as someone in their mid 20s and many folks in their mid 20s go through kind of an existential career crisis. What will I be doing for the rest of my life? What don't I like? What do I like? You know, and having an, as you know, side note, having as many experiences as possible uh, really helps to figure out what you don't want to do. And that was one of those moments. I do not want to be in one of those environments again. Uh, I don't know if I'll stay in selling the rest of my life. I was thinking at the time, but I do not want to be in one of those environments. So after that role, I took some time off, you know, a couple of years, I was able to pay off my student loans and have a little bit of a reemergence of my soccer career. But at the time I, I began working for my dad and, and had time to reflect, you know, I'm getting close to my thirties. It's the end of my twenties. What is it that I want to do? And that's where the idea spawned, having time to reflect, having some creative space having some time away from the career and the field allowed the inception of potential new future in selling. Did you have to always be aggressive? Did you always have to push until either a yes they're in or a no they're out forever? Was there another way? How could you have high performing environment? without hurting relationships every time. You know, just don't get me wrong. These sales professionals are, that I were with had great numbers, but at a very high cost, hurting reputation, hurting relationships, causing resentment. And that wasn't something that started and ended with that remodeling company I was with. I mean, this was something that had gone on in some of my research to the boiler room days um, with Wall Street investment companies. You know, in that time of the 70s and 80s and 90s, there were so many scams in the investment world, in the B2C telemarketing and, you know, insurance world that created laws against sales environments. You know, the SEC banned boiler rooms uh, the telemarketing sales rule, the FTC and the FCC, the DNC, and I'm saying a lot of buzzword acronyms here, uh, Federal Trade Commission, Federal Communications Commission, and the do not call list, you know, all began. They all were, from what I can see, a result from a lot of these telemarketing uh, Ponzi schemes and scams that were prolific, you know, in the seventies to nineties. So here we are in 2009, 2010, and we are in an environment that is the rise of digital, right? Websites, SEO, internet marketing, uh, an aversion to salespeople, you know, will, will sale the questions begin? Will, will selling be allowed? Will outbound, influential, belief, evangelistic selling even be a profession in the future. And my answer was yes. At that time, I was, wherever I was playing soccer, I was cold calling for my dad's company, setting meetings with executives from cold calls, making sales from cold calls. And this is 12, 
2012, 2013, 2014, still happening. You know, 2008, it was still happening. I was able to generate leads and leads and appointments at these events. 2013, 2014, cold calls, and started to test, started to think about this as I began the cold call and and kind of a consulting business that had a message. You know, how, how can I achieve high performing sales results, but not have to hurt every relationship? How can I keep those relationships? How can I have those relationships come back when those folks are ready and maximize and even go farther than these outdated cutthroat sell now or sell never mentalities. And that is the heart of H to H that is the end of the story of how sales began for me and why, and the beginning of the why. So cl- close this out. I think the why began with the inception of the H to H method and the, the cold call scripting, the cold call training, and the beginning of superhuman prospecting, the outsourced cold calling service that we have running today. Whew, that was a lot. Hopefully uh, you didn't get drowned out. Hopefully you were able to stay along that path, went through a lot of tangents, a lot of stories, but everything will stem from that. Anything of my experience that I talk about will stem from those stories and that history. But I think it's just one story. I think it's just one way that I would like and our team is advancing the profession. But there's so many others that are going on right now. There is a mass movement in advancing the profession. There are bachelor's degrees in the last 10 years. University of Toledo, where I'm from, actually has one. Baylor University, uh, U, uh, University of South Florida, with a variety of others. And are adding on masters of sales programs, masters of sales leadership. And I think it's brilliant. I think it's a raw talent, raw material that can be crafted into a organized and formal education. So many folks have this talent and skill, but only some of them, those talents and skills are being used because the jobs that they have don't require them, but the sales profession has a lot of opportunity for people and they don't know it. And that's what we hope to build as part of our recruiting to build in a foundation of strong selling values as a part of H to H and superhuman, and then have an impact on the marketplace, change the hearts and minds of buyers into believers of our products and service that deliver value. And also at the same time, keep that relationship if they aren't ready. And I think that will change the movement to a more positive selling environment. I think it's needed with the rise of chat GPT and AI and a lot of uh, nervous professionals out there to have the human element with a soul, with a heart that can give answers that can be truthful, that can read emotion and be empathetic and come from a place of connection that only the human to human interaction can provide. So excited to join, excited to jump on this journey and excited for anyone who wants to join with us, we're out.